Welcome, 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 everybody, to another episode of Fantasy News. I am your disheveled goblin host, Daniel Green, and today we have quite the cheese-heavy charcuterie board of fantasy news to get through. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump on into it. And you know we gotta kick it off with the news that well-known fantasy mega-nerd Stephen Colbert is officially attached to the upcoming adaptation of the Amber Chronicles, or Chronicles of Amber. Stephen Colbert is going to be a producer on this project alongside Robert Kirkman in Skybound Entertainment. And almost as notable as Stephen Colbert being involved in the project, this update comes seven years after The Walking Dead creator Robert Kirkman announced he was originally working on this adaptation, but it seems there's finally some momentum in the sales. Now, Chronicles of Amber is quite the notable series in the resume of fantasy, having sold over 15 million copies worldwide, though it's still not in its peak of popularity. George R. R. Martin himself, though, has said he is surprised it has not been adapted. And when giving a statement about the adaptation in the work, Stephen Colbert said, George R. R. Martin and I have similar dreams. I've carried the story of Corwin in my my head for over 40 years, and I am thrilled to partner with Skybound and Vincent Newman to bring these worlds to life. All roads lead to Amber, and I am happy to be walking them. Now, personally, I read the first book in the Amber series and wasn't the biggest fan of it, but absolutely do understand and see the potential of an adaptation. I by no means think I am the opinion of objective truth. And I am also a little bit excited to see more classic-ish, or at least not the most of modern fantasy series series get the adaptation treatment as well. Obviously, big names like Lord of the Rings and Chronicles of Narnia have been getting adaptations for ages, but there is still a massive catalog of fantasy stories pre-2000 that are absolutely worth this treatment, and I know I just made some people go, are you calling pre-2000s fantasy stories classic? But I hate to break it to you, we're closer to that being considered the standard than you might think. And the Amber series was published between 1970 and 1991, which I think definitely keeps it under the classic in terms of the modern standards of fantasy. Debate me in the comments. But we're gonna switch on over here to covering a slightly smaller series titled the Sun Eater series. Christopher Rocchio has come out and announced that the Sun Eater series will actually be publishing its final two books with a new publisher. Now I'm covering this for two reasons. One, I think it's always fascinating to cover the publishing side of storytelling, especially with smaller series where the author has to kind of fight a bit harder to get exactly what they want. And Christopher did a wonderful job putting out a video where he explains everything that's going on, and it's really fascinating, even if you're not a fan of the series, of course, link down below. But I'm also covering this because I do want to get in the habit of covering smaller series and their updates here on Fantasy News to help them gain attention. So for everyone who does contribute to Fantasy News stories, please feel free to publish any you see in the Discord server where I do collect these stories. But getting into the Sun Eater update, essentially it was originally pitched as five books, and that was what the contract with the original publisher was. Now that the five book part of that contract is coming to an end, Christopher has decided to go with a new publisher while trying the best he can to maintain the look and feel from the original publisher, so hopefully there will not be that unnecessary difference on your shelf. Like this change that happened when it was the same publisher for no fucking reason. <laughs> Sorry, I just... <laughs> <laughs> Kayla's off screen giving me a look right now. It is a problem. It is worth getting upset about. So if you'd like more details into exactly the why and how of this, please feel free to go check out Christopher's channel where I think he's doing a fantastic job of engaging with his fans, answering questions, and keeping everyone up to date on the really interesting life of a publishing author. But speaking of covers, we also got a fantastic cover reveal over at Orbit for The Blighted Stars by Megan E. O'Keefe. Orbit is continually just killing it with covers, in my opinion, and their art director just just good job. I just want to end this story by saying, Megan O'Keefe, your book looks sensational, and art director at Orbit, you're fucking awesome. Now that I said those nice things that I very sincerely meant, can you please send me copies of The Expanse where I don't have to have an inconsistency of author name to title? It makes no sense, please. And Jamie Jones, the artist who did this art, I, I want to keep you in mind for future projects for me because this is a good looking cover. 
Is that okay? I'm gonna follow you on Twitter right now. Now, before we get into the Wizards of the Coast update, a quick word from today's sponsor, NordVPN. NordVPN has been a huge sponsor of the channel, has become my go-to VPN service. They run a gambit of defensive strategies to keep your devices protected by securing passwords, encrypting files, safeguarding personal data and internet activity, identifying threats like malware or ransomware, and neutralizing cyber threats before they can do any real damage to your device. And by avoiding these malicious websites, blocking trackers, and intrusive ads, your device will be able to search and view websites faster and smoother. Secure up to six devices on just one account and choose from NordVPN's over 6,500 servers worldwide. You can really bounce around there. Have a new country every day. Their app is easy to use and when you enable the threat protection feature in your NordVPN app setting, it protects your browsing even when you're not connected to a NordVPN server. Best of all, they offer a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you try out the service and it turns out it's not for you, you can go ahead and cancel it risk-free. So head on over to nordvpn.com slash green and check out your exclusive offer today. Back to the video. Okay, Wizards of the Coast. The updates here have been coming in fast and hard. And in the last fantasy news, you guys saw me putting in updates just an hour before the video went live because there was just so many things developing so quickly. And honestly, my fantasy news format for stories like this that just have update, update, update is not necessarily the best because I'm trying to make like a weekly recap and sometimes stuff is happening minute by minute. But boiling a lot of things down and having to dig up like like deleted tweets on my end here, it seems that currently Wizards of the Coast is at least backing down in a sense, though I am always hesitant when you see a company like this be like, oh, sorry, everyone's so mad. We're, we're gonna not do it as bad as we were gonna do it because then inevitably ask the question, what are you still gonna do? And that Wizards of the Coast still has not entirely clarified on, though a few of their key points, they do seem to be backpedaling quite aggressively, like the ownership of content made by third parties, which was an insane part for them to put in the OGL. Yes, they had a thing that was like, anything you make while using our systems is actually ours. What? And they had the audacity to put in their statement that like, we never even thought of trying to make profit or owning other people's content then why did you put it in there? And there have been additional leaks about how the company still doesn't give a crap about its customers, surveys are being ignored, but a lot of this is still leaks and it does make me uncomfortable to cover leaks in general for stuff because a lot of the time it does turn out not to be true, though we have a few people within the community saying like, no, I verified it, it for sure is. It's buidu, buidu, buidu time, everybody, because guess what? While I was literally about to release this video, it was uploaded. That that's how last minute we're doing this stuff now. D&D Beyond has released another official statement regarding what they're calling the OGL 1.2. And I'm going to read through what they are highlighting as the main points now. Note, this has not even been released long enough. There'd be a general consensus of fan reaction for me to look at. So I am just going to be reading their bullet points on what they are saying is the most important part of this. And they go as follows. So we are doing two things. We're giving the core D&D mechanics to the community through a Creative Commons license, which means that they are fully in your hands. If you want to use quintessentially D&D content from the SRD, such as Owlbears and Magic Missiles, OGL 1.2 will provide you a perpetual, irrevocable license to do so. Then moving on to a couple more highlighted points they have said are the important beats from this update. Protecting D&D's inclusive play experience. As I said above, content more clearly associated with D&D is what falls under the OGL. You'll see that OGL 1.2 lets us act when offensive or hurtful content is published using the covered D&D stuff. We want an inclusive, safe play experience for everyone. This is deeply important to us and OGL 1.8 didn't give us any ability to ensure it. Tabletop RPGs and VTTs. OGL 1.2 will only apply to tabletop RPG content, whether published as book, as electronic publications, or on virtual tabletops, VTTs. Nobody needs to wonder or worry if it applies to anything else. It doesn't. Deauthorizing OGL 1.A. We know this is a big concern. The Creative Commons license and the open terms of 1.2 are intended to help with that. 
one key reason why we have to deauthorize. We can't use the protective options in 1.2 if someone can just choose to publish harmful, discriminatory, or illegal content under 1.0a. And again, any content you have already published under OGL 1.a will still always be licensed under OGL 1.0a. Very limited license changes allowed. Only two sections can be changed once OGL 1.2 is live. How you cite wizards in your work and how we can contact each other. We don't know what the future holds or what technologies we will use to communicate with each other. So we thought that these two sections needed to be future-proofed. For completeness, let's sum up what else in OGL 1.2 and supporting documents. Virtual tabletop policy. We will continue to support VTT usage for both OGL creators and VTT operators. The virtual tabletop policy spells this out. Ownership disputes. You own your content. You don't give wizards any license back. And for any ownership disputes, you can sue for breach of contract and money damages. No hateful content or conduct. If you include harmful, discriminatory, or illegal content, we can terminate your OGL 1.2. Creator produced badge. You'll have the options to include a badge on your OGL works. Once we get your feedback on the badge, we'll create a guide on how to use and display it. There are a few things within that that I think do seem like a positive step, but still not quite enough in my opinion, and a few things that make me raise an eyebrow due to specific word is usage. Though again, I'm not an expert, so I don't feel comfortable saying one way too strongly or the other, and I, like you, will be keeping my ear open for people who are more in depth in this community and update you as I learn. So here's my approach. That's the general update I can give to you as of now on a late Thursday afternoon of what the current situation is. Wizards of the Coast does seem to be backpedaling, but if you would like a much more informed compared to what I'm able to provide with my experience level with this topic's deep dive into the situation, I highly recommend things like Legal Eagles delving into everything that happened up into the point of when his video was released, or checking out content creators like Young Ye who are dedicating entire videos to going into each and every single update. I just really hate the potential of spreading fake news news when things are developing so fast and so hard to verify. But from here, we're going to pivot on over into the premiere of The Last of Us on HBO Max, which was the second biggest premiere HBO Max saw this year with 4.7 million viewers. Now, obviously those numbers are far higher now. I'll try and find them and have on the screen now of the viewership up to date for The Last of Us. But I really am not surprised at all to see this being such a high premiere. And I expect those numbers just to go up with how raving the general consensus of the reviews seems to be. The only negative feedback I've seen, and this is really funny to me with how many video game fans I've seen in the past just dogpiling adaptations of games for changing too much the source material, but a lot of people seem to be saying it's too true to the game. It's not very surprising, which I disagree with to an extent, but also I see it as a valid thing if you want something that's a bit more surprising, a bit new to you. For me, while admitting it is really close, I don't think it's a one-to-one -one reenactment, but also the newness to it comes from seeing performers and direction and cinematography that is very different from the game. It's a reinterpretation, a adaptation. But hey, good news all around. Apparently the whole world has amnesia and once again we're claiming the video game curse is broken despite, you know, things like Arcane and Tomb Raider and many any other good video game adaptations? <laughs> but in the final piece of fantasy news we're recovering here today, it seems that Attack on Titan, the final season, which how many times has it been the final season now, has an update. From Studio Mappo, they said, to those who look forward to it, this time the release date has been announced for Attack on Titan, the final season, part three. Okay, so it's part three of the... <sighs> We would like to inform you, our company, initially, we have continued production with the goal of broadcasting all part three on March 3rd. However, in the process of proceeding with production, the amount of work expanded significantly than expected. And after consulting with the production committee staff, we will release in two parts, part one and part two. Attack on Titan will be completed at the next timing, part two. I would like to express my deepest gratitude for all of you who have been looking forward to this event. We promise all our employees and staff that we will focus on the production of Attack on Titan until the end. I hope you will give us a little more time. Thank you for the support, MAPPA. Part three, split into two parts of that final season. <laughs> And I, I, hey, that's totally fine. Whatever you gotta do to not crunch your staff, make sure it's as good as it can possibly be. I am not 
complaining but I am poking a little bit of fun. Not even criticizing. Like, I actually do respect this, like, hey, it's not perfect and we want to get it perfect, so we're going to be spreading it out. And that's fine. It's not like they're just creating additional content that doesn't need to be there to bloat it to make money. This does, at least from the perspective of now, feel like they're just trying to tell the story the best they possibly can. It is just also still very funny. But wrapping up today's news, I wanted to give you a statement from Kayla who designed and launched the merch line that you all made our best selling ever with things like the disheveled goblin hoodie. From me personally, thank you again. But here is the statement from Kayla who just didn't want to appear on camera today. Hi everyone, sorry I'm not available for this video, but I wanted to make sure I personally thanked all of you from the bottom of my heart for the love and support you showed for our first merch drop. We had people from all over the world, from Norway to South Korea, Austria to Germany, Guatemala to Brazil, and many more, and I couldn't help but smile at the idea of so many disheveled goblins running around the world. Please know, if we ever see you in person wearing the merch, I will come up and say hello to you. I hope you will all love your products once they arrive. And personal note for me, it, when you get them, if you could like have a Twitter and send me a photo of you wearing it, that's I don't know if that's weird or not, but I'd love to see people wearing some goblin merch. I hope you will all love your products once they arrive. Feel free to send us pictures either on Instagram or Twitter. Oh yeah, there you go. She covered you. My bad. And continue to let us know your thoughts on them. We want to make sure if there are any things we can improve on, we hear from you all directly. I will try to find manufacturers of more inclusive sizing for as many products as possible for our next launch. Hugs to all of you. And our goal for now seems to be to do seasonal drops as well as developing a line that will just be the staple merch that is just under the channel for good in the future as well. Kayla is kind of taking the initiative to make a clothing line here and I am really, really excited for the disheveled goblin to just become a look. But thank you everyone for tuning into this episode of Fantasy News. Thank you to the sponsor, NordVPN. Check out the link down below and have a go on y'all. Peace.